Chapter 5. Oliver mingles with new associates, going to a funeral for the first time. He forms an unfavorable notion of his master's business. Oliver, being left to himself in the undertaker's shop, set the lamp down on a workman's bench and gazed timidly about him with a feeling of awe and dread, which many people a good deal older than he will be at no loss to understand. An unfinished coffin on black trestles, which stood in the middle of the shop, looked so gloomy and death-like that a cold tremble came over him. Every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object, from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head, to drive him mad with terror. Against the wall were ranged, in regular array, a long row of elm boards cut in the same shape, looking in the dim light, like high-shouldered ghosts with their hands in their breeches pockets. Coffin plates, elm chips, bright-headed nails, and shreds of black cloth lay scattered on the floor, and the wall behind the counter was ornamented with a lively representation of two mutes in very stiff neckcloths, on duty at a large private door, with a hearse drawn by four black steeds, approaching in in the distance, the shop was close and hot. The atmosphere seemed tainted with the smell of coffins. The recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave. Nor were these the only dismal feelings which depressed Oliver. He was alone in a strange place, and we all know how chilled and desolate the best of us will sometimes feel in such a situation. The boy had no friends to care for, or to care for him. The regret of no recent separation was fresh in his mind. The absence of no loved and well-remembered face sank heavily into his heart. But his heart was heavy, notwithstanding, and he wished, as he crept into his narrow bed, that that were his coffin, and that he could be lain in a calm and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground, with the tall grass waving gently above his head, and the sound of the old deep bell to soothe him in his sleep. Oliver was awakened in the morning, by a loud kicking at the outside of the shop door, which, before he could huddle on his clothes, was repeated, in an angry and impetuous manner, about twenty-five times, when he began to undo the chain. The legs desisted, and a voice began, Open the door, will yer? cried the voice which belonged to the legs which had kicked at the door. I will, directly, sir, replied Oliver, undoing the chain, and turning the key. I suppose you're the new boy, ain't yer? said the voice through the keyhole. Yes, sir, replied Oliver. How old are yer? inquired the voice. Ten, sir, replied Oliver. Then I'll whop yer when I get in, said the voice. You just see if I don't, that's all. My work is brat. And having made this obliging promise, the voice began to whistle. Oliver had been too often subjected to the process to which the very expressive monosyllable just recorded bears reference, to entertain the smallest doubt that the owner of the voice, whoever he might be, would redeem his pledge, most honorably. He drew back the bolts with a trembling hand, and opened the door, for a second or two. Oliver glanced up the street, and down the street, and over the way, impressed with the belief that the unknown, who had addressed him through the keyhole, had walked a few paces off, to warm himself, for nobody did he see but a big charity boy, sitting on a post in front of the house, eating a slice of bread and butter, which he cut into wedges, the size of his mouth, with a clasp knife, and then consumed with great dexterity. I beg your pardon, sir, said Oliver at length, seeing that no other visitor made his appearance, did you knock? I kicked, replied the charity boy. Did you want a coffin, sir? inquired Oliver, innocently. At this, the charity boy looked monstrous fierce, and said that Oliver would want one before long, if he cut jokes with his superiors in that way. You don't know who I am, I suppose, workus, said the charity boy, in continuation, descending from the top of the post, meanwhile, with edifying gravity. No, sir, rejoined Oliver. I'm Mr. Noah Claypool, said the charity boy, and you're under me. Take down the shutters, your idle young ruffian. With this, Mr. Claypool Claypool administered a kick to Oliver, and entered the shop with a dignified air, which did him great credit. It is difficult for a large-headed, small-eyed youth, of lumbering make and heavy countenance, to look dignified under any circumstances, but it is more especially so, when superadded to these personal attractions are a red nose and yellow smalls. Oliver, having taken down the shutters, and broken a pane of glass in his effort to stagger away beneath the weight of the first one to a small court at the side of the house in which they were kept during the day, was graciously assisted by Noah who having consoled him with the assurance that he'd catch it, condescended to help him. Mr. Sorberry came down soon after. Shortly afterwards, Mrs. Sorberry appeared. Oliver having caught it, in fulfillment of Noah's prediction, followed that young gentleman down the stairs to breakfast. Come near the fire, Noah, said Charlotte. I saved a nice little bit of bacon for you from master's breakfast. Oliver, shut that door at Mr. Noah's back, and take them bits that I've put out on the cover of the bread pan. There's your tea, take it away to that box, and drink it there, and make haste, for they'll want you to mind the shop. 
Get here, get here, Workus, said Noah Claypool. Lord, Noah, said Charlotte, what a rum creature you are. Why don't you let the boy alone? Let him alone, said Noah. Why everybody lets him alone enough, for the matter of that, neither his father nor his mother will ever interfere with him. All his relations let him have his own way pretty well. Hey, Charlotte, he, 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 oh, you queer soul, said Charlotte, bursting into a hearty laugh, in which she was joined by Noah, after which they both looked scornfully at poor Oliver Twist as he sat shivering on the box in the coldest corner of the room and ate the stale pieces which had been specially reserved for him. No was a charity boy, but not a workhouse orphan. No chance child was he, for he could trace his genealogy all the way back to his parents, who lived hard by his mother being a washerwoman and his father a drunken soldier discharged with a wooden leg and a dernal pension of twopence halfpenny and an unstatable fraction the shop boys in the neighborhood had long been in the habit of branding noah in the public streets with the ignominious epithets of leathers charity and the like and noah had borne them without reply but now that fortune had cast in his way a nameless orphan at whom even the meanest could point the finger of scorn he retorted on him with interest this affords charming food for contemplation it shows us what a beautiful thing human nature may be made to be and how impartially the same amiable qualities are developed in the finest lord and the dirtiest charity boy oliver had been sojourning at the undertaker's some three weeks or a month mr and mrs sowerberry the shop being shut up were taking their supper in the little back parlor when mr sowerberry after several deferential glances at his wife said my dear he was going to say more but mrs sowerberry looking up with a peculiarly unpropitious aspect he stopped short well said mrs sowerberry sharply nothing my dear nothing said mr sowerberry ugh you brute said mrs sowerberry not at all my dear said mr sowerberry humbly i thought you didn't want to hear my dear i was only going to say oh don't tell me what you were going to say interposed mrs sowerberry i am nobody don't consult me pray i don't want to intrude upon your secrets as mrs sowerberry said this she gave an hysterical laugh which threatened violent consequences but my dear said sowerberry i want to ask your advice no, no, don't ask mine, replied Mrs. Sowerberry, in an affecting manner, ask somebody else's. Here, there was another hysterical laugh, which frightened Mr. Sowerberry very much. This is a very common and much approved matrimonial course of treatment, which is often very effective, and at once reduced Mr. Sowerberry to begging, as a special favor, to be allowed to say what Mrs. Sowerberry was most curious to hear. After a short duration, the permission was most graciously conceded. It's only about young Twist, my dear, said Mr. Sowerberry, a very good-looking boy, that, my dear, he need be, for he eats enough, observed the lady. There's an expression of melancholy in his face, my dear, resumed Mr. Sowerberry, which is very interesting interesting he would make a delightful mute my love mrs sowerberry looked up with an expression of considerable wonderment mr sowerberry remarked it and without allowing time for any observation on the good lady's part proceeded i don't mean a regular mute to attend grown-up people my dear but only for children's practice it would be very new to have a mute in proportion my dear you may depend upon it it would have a superb effect mrs sowerberry who had a good deal of taste in the undertaking way was much struck by the novelty of this idea but as it would have been compromising her dignity to have said so under existing circumstances she merely inquired with much sharpness why such such an obvious suggestion had not presented itself to her husband's mind before. Mr. Sowerberry rightly construed this as an acquiescence in his proposition. It was speedily determined, therefore, that Oliver should be at once initiated into the mysteries of the trade, and, with this view, that he should accompany his master on the very next occasion of his services being required. The occasion was not long in coming. Half an hour after breakfast next morning, Mr. Bumble entered the shop and supporting his cane against the counter drew forth his large leathern pocket-book from which he selected a small scrap of paper which he handed over to sowerberry oh him yeah, said the undertaker glancing over it with a lively countenance an order for a coffin a eh? for a coffin first and a parochial funeral afterwards replied mr bumble fastening the strap of the leathern pocket-book which like himself was very corpulent Peyton, said the undertaker, looking from the scrap of paper to Mr. Bumble. I never heard the name before. Bumble shook his head, as he replied, Obstinate people, Mr. Sowerberry, very obstinate. Proud, too, I'm afraid, sir. Proud, eh? exclaimed Mr. Sowerberry with a sneer. Come, that's too much. Oh, it's sickening, replied the beetle. Antimonial, Mr. Sowerberry. So it is, acquiesced the undertaker. We only heard of the family the night before last, said the beetle, and we shouldn't have known anything about them. Then, only a woman who lodges in the the same house made an application to the parochial committee for them to send the parochial surgeon to see a woman as was very bad. 
he had gone out to dinner, but his prentice sent him some medicine in a blacking bottle offhand. Ah, there's promptness, said the undertaker. Promptness, indeed, replied the beetle. But what's the consequence? What's the ungrateful behavior of these rebels, sir? Why, the husband sends back word that the medicine won't suit his wife's complaint, and so she shan't take it, says she shan't take it, sir. Good, strong, wholesome medicine, as was given with great success to two Irish laborers and a coal heaver only a week before, sent him for nothing with a blackened bottle in, and he sends back word that she shan't take it, sir. As the atrocity presented itself to Mr. Bumble's mind in full force, he struck the counter sharply with his cane, and became flushed with indignation. Well, said the undertaker, I need ver, did, never did, sir, ejaculated the beetle. No, nor nobody never did. But now she's dead, we've got to bury her, and that's the direction, and the sooner it's done, the better, thus saying, Mr. Bumble put on his cocked hat wrong side first, in a fever of parochial excitement, and flounced out of the shop. Why, he was so angry, Oliver, that he forgot even to ask after you, said Mr. Sowerberry, looking after the beetle as he strode down the street. Yes, sir, replied Oliver, who had carefully kept himself out of sight during the interview, and who was shaking from head to foot at the mere recollection of the sound of Mr. Bumble's voice. He needn't have taken the trouble to shrink from Mr. Bumble's glance, however, for that functionary, on whom the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat had made a very strong impression, thought that now the undertaker had got Oliver upon trial the subject was better avoided, until such time as he should be firmly bound for seven years, and all danger of his being returned upon the hands of the parish should be thus effectually and legally overcome. Well, said Mr. Sowerberry, taking up his hat, the sooner this job is done, the better. Noah, look after the shop. Oliver, put on your cap, and come with me. Oliver obeyed, and followed his master on his professional mission. They walked on, for some time, through the most crowded and densely inhabited part of the town, and then, striking down a narrow street more dirty and miserable than any they had yet passed through, paused to look for the house which was the object of their search. The houses on either side were high and large, but very old, and tenanted by people of the poorest class, as their neglected appearance would have sufficiently denoted, without the concurrent testimony afforded by the squalid looks of the few men, and women who, with folded arms and bodies half-doubled, occasionally skulked along. A great many of the tenements had shop fronts, but these were fast closed, and mouldering away, only the upper rooms being inhabited. Some houses which had become insecure from age and decay were prevented from falling into the street by huge beams of wood reared against the walls and firmly planted in the road but even these crazy dens seemed to have been selected as the nightly haunts of some houseless wretches for many of the rough boards which supplied the place of door and window were wrenched from their positions to afford an aperture wide enough for the passage of a human body the kennel was stagnant and filthy the very rats which here and there lay putrefying in its rottenness were hideous with famine there was neither knocker nor bell handle at the open door where oliver and his master stopped so groping his way cautiously cautiously through the dark passage, and bidding Oliver keep close to him and not be afraid the undertaker mounted to the top of the first flight of stairs, stumbling against a door on the landing. He rapped at it with his knuckles. It was opened by a young girl of thirteen or fourteen. The undertaker at once saw enough of what the room contained, to know it was the apartment to which he had been directed. He stepped in, Oliver followed him. There was no fire in the room, but a man was crouching mechanically over the empty stove an old woman too had drawn a low stool to the cold hearth and was sitting beside him there were some ragged children in another corner and in a small recess opposite the door there lay upon the ground something covered with an old blanket oliver shuddered as he cast his eyes toward the place and crept involuntarily closer to his master for though it was covered up the boy felt that it was a corpse the man's face was thin and very pale his hair and beard were grisly his eyes were bloodshot the old woman's face was wrinkled her two remaining teeth protruded over her under lip and her eyes were bright and piercing oliver was afraid to look at either her or the man they seemed so like the rats he had seen outside nobody shall go near her said the man starting fiercely up as the undertaker approached the recess keep back damn you keep back if you've a life to lose nonsense my good man said the undertaker who was pretty well used to misery in all its shapes nonsense i tell you said the man clenching his hands and stamping furiously on the floor i tell you i won't have her put into the ground she couldn't rest there. The worms would worry her, not eat her. She is so worn away. The undertaker offered no reply to this raving, but producing a tape from his pocket, knelt down for a moment by the side of the body. Uh, said the man, bursting into tears and sinking on his knees at the feet of the dead woman. Kneel down, kneel down, kneel round her, every one of you, and mark my words. I say she was starved to death. I never knew how bad she was till the fever came upon her. 
and then her bones were starting through the skin. There was neither fire nor candle. She died in the dark, in the dark. She couldn't even see her children's faces, though we heard her gasping out their names. I begged for her in the streets, and they sent me to prison. When I came back, she was dying, and all the blood in my heart has dried up, for they starved her to death. I swear it before the God that saw it. They starved her. He twined his hands in his hair, and, with a loud scream, rolled groveling upon the floor, his eyes fixed, and the foam covering his lips. The terrified children cried bitterly, but the old woman, who had hitherto remained as quiet as if she had been wholly deaf to all that passed, menaced them into silence, having unloosened the cravat of the man who still remained extended on the ground, she tottered towards the undertaker. She was my daughter, said the old woman, nodding her head in the direction of the corpse, and speaking with an idiotic leer, more ghastly than even the presence of death in such a place. Lord, Lord, well, it is strange that I who gave birth to her, and was a woman then, should be alive and merry now, and she lying there, so cold and stiff. Lord, Lord, to think of it, it's as good as a play, as good as a play. As the wretched creature mumbled and chuckled in her hideous merriment, the undertaker turned to go away. Stop, stop, said the old woman in a loud whisper. Will she be buried tomorrow, or next day, or tonight? I laid her out, and I must walk, you know. Send me a large cloak, a good warm one, for it is bitter cold. We should have cake and wine, too, before we go. Never mind, send some bread, only a loaf of bread and a cup of water. Shall we have some bread, dear? She said eagerly, catching at the undertaker's coat, as he once more moved towards the door. Yes, yes, said the undertaker, of course, anything you like. He disengaged himself from the old woman's grasp, and, drawing Oliver after him, hurried away. The next day, Oliver and his master returned to the miserable abode, where Mr. Bumble had already arrived, accompanied by four men from the workhouse who were to act as bearers. An old black cloak had been thrown over the rags of the old woman, and the men, and the bear coffin having been screwed down, was hoisted on the shoulders of the bearers, and carried into the street. Now, you must put your best leg foremost, old lady, whispered Sorberry in the old woman's ear, we are rather late, and it won't do, to keep the clergyman waiting. Move on, my men, as quick as you like. Thus directed, the bearers trotted on under their light burden, and the two mourners kept as near them as they could. Mr. Bumble and Sorberry walked at a good smart pace in front, and Oliver, whose legs were not so long as his master's, ran by the side. There was not so great a necessity for hurrying as Mr. Sorberry had anticipated, however, for when they reached the obscure corner of the churchyard in which the nettles grew, and where the parish graves were made, the clergyman had not arrived, and the clerk, who was sitting by the vestry room fire, seemed to think it by no means improbable that it might be an hour or so before he came. So, they put the beer on the brink of the grave, and the two mourners waited patiently in the damp clay, with the cold rain drizzling down, while the ragged boys whom the spectacle had attracted into the churchyard played a noisy game at hide and seek among the tombstones, or varied their amusements by jumping backwards and forwards over the coffin. Mr. Sowerberry and Bumble, being personal friends of the clerk, sat by the fire with him, and read the paper. At length, after a lapse of something more than an hour, Mr. Bumble, and Sowerberry, and the clerk, were seen running towards the grave. Immediately afterwards, the clergyman appeared, putting on his surplice as he came along. Mr. Bumble then thrashed a boy or two, to keep up appearances, and the reverend gentleman, having read as much of the burial service as could be compressed into four minutes, gave his surplice to the clerk, and walked away again. Now, Bill, said had Sorberry to the grave digger, fill up. It was no very difficult task, for the grave was so full that the uppermost coffin was within a few feet of the surface. The grave digger shoveled in the earth, stamped it loosely down with his feet, shouldered his spade, and walked off, followed by the boys, who murmured very loud complaints at the fun being over so soon. Come, my good fellow, said Bumble, tapping the man on the back. They want to shut up the yard. The man who had never once moved, since he had taken his station by the graveside, started, raised his head, stared at the person who had addressed him, walked forward for a few paces, and fell down in a swoon. The crazy old old woman was too much occupied in bewailing the loss of her cloak, to pay him any attention, so they threw a can of cold water over him, and when he came to, saw him safely out of the churchyard, locked the gate, and departed on their different ways. Well, Oliver, said Sorberry, as they walked home, how do you like it? Pretty well, thank you, sir, replied Oliver, with considerable hesitation. Not very much, sir. Ah, you'll get used to it in time. Oliver, said Sorberry, nothing when you are used to it, my boy. Oliver wondered, in his own mind whether it had taken a very long time to get Mr. Sorberry used to it, but he thought it better not to ask the question, and walked back to the shop, thinking over all he had seen and heard. Chapter 6 Oliver, being goaded by the taunts of Noah, rouses into action, and rather astonishes him. The month's trial over, Oliver was formally apprenticed, 
It was a nice sickly season just at this time. In commercial phrase, coffins were looking up, and in the course of a few weeks, Oliver acquired a great deal of experience. The success of Mr. Sorberry's ingenious speculation exceeded even his most sanguine hopes. The oldest inhabitants recollected no period at which measles had been so prevalent or so fatal to infant existence, and many were the mournful processions which little Oliver headed, in a hat band reaching down to his knees, to the indescribable admiration and emotion of all the mothers in the town. As Oliver accompanied his master in most of his adult expeditions too, in order that he might acquire that equanimity of demeanor and full command of nerve which was essential to a finished undertaker. He had many opportunities of observing the beautiful resignation and fortitude with which some strong-minded people bear their trials and losses. For instance, when Sorberry had an order for the burial of some rich old lady or gentleman, who was surrounded by a great number of nephews and nieces who had been perfectly inconsolable during the previous illness and whose grief had been wholly irrepressible even on the most public occasions they would be as happy among themselves as need be quite cheerful and contented conversing together with as much freedom and gaiety as if nothing whatever had happened to disturb them husbands too wore the loss of their wives with the most heroic calmness wives again put on weeds for their husbands as if so far from grieving in the garb of sorrow they had made up their minds to render it as becoming and attractive as possible it was observable too that ladies and gentlemen who were in passions of anguish during the ceremony of interment recovered almost as soon as they reached home and became quite composed before the tea drinking was over all this was very pleasant and improving to see, and Oliver beheld it with great admiration. That Oliver Twist was moved to resignation by the example of these good people, I cannot, although I am his biographer, undertake to affirm with any degree of confidence, but I can most distinctly say, that for many months he continued meekly to submit to the domination and ill-treatment of Noah Claypool, who used him far worse than before, now that his jealousy was roused by seeing the new boy promoted to the black stick and hat band, while he, the old one, remained stationary in the muffin cap and leathers. Charlotte treated him ill, because Noah did, and Mrs. Sorberry was his decided enemy, because Mr. Sorberry was disposed to be his friend. So, between these three on one side, and a glut of funerals on the other, Oliver was not altogether as comfortable as the hungry pig was, when he was shut up, by mistake, in the grain department of a brewery. And now, I come to a very important passage in Oliver's history, for I have to record an act, slight and unimportant perhaps in appearance, but which indirectly produced a material change in all his future prospects and proceedings. One day, Oliver and Noah had descended into the kitchen at the usual dinner hour to banquet upon a small joint of mutton, a pound and a half of the worst end of the neck. When Charlotte being called out of the way, there ensued a brief interval of time, which Noah Claypole, being hungry and vicious, considered he could not possibly devote to a worthier purpose than aggravating and tantalizing young Oliver Twist. Intent upon this innocent amusement, Noah put his feet on the tablecloth, and pulled Oliver's hair, and twitched his ears, and expressed his opinion that he was a sneak, and furthermore announced his intention of coming to see him hang, whenever that desirable event should take place, and entered upon various topics of petty annoyance, like a malicious and ill-conditioned charity boy as he was. But, making Oliver cry, Noah attempted to be more facetious still, and in his attempt, did what many sometimes do to this day, when they want to be funny, he got rather personal, work is said noah how's your mother she's dead replied oliver don't you say anything about her to me oliver's color rose as he said this he breathed quickly and there was a curious working of the mouth and nostrils which mr claypole thought must be the immediate precursor of a violent fit of crying under this impression he returned to the charge what did she die of workus said noah of a broken heart some of our old nurses told me replied oliver more as if he were talking to himself than answering noah i think i know what it must be to die of that Tonda ra la la right fall larry workus said noah as a tear rolled down oliver's cheek what set you a sniveling now not you replied oliver sharply there that's enough don't say anything more to me about her you'd better not better not exclaimed noah well better not workus don't be impudent your mother, too. She was a nice un she was. Oh, Lord. And here, Noah nodded his head expressively, and curled up as much of his small red nose as muscular action could collect together, for the occasion. Here, no, workus, continued Noah, emboldened by Oliver's silence, and speaking in a jeering tone of affected pity, of all tones the most annoying. Here, no, workus, it can't be helped now. And of course you couldn't help it then. And I am very sorry for it, and I'm sure we all are, and pity you very much. But you must know, Workus, your mother was a regular right down bad un. What did you say? inquired Oliver, looking up very quickly. A regular right down bad un? 
Workus, replied Noah, coolly, and it's a great deal better, Workus, that she died when she did, or else she'd have been hard laboring in Bridewell, or transported, or hung, which is more likely than either, isn't it? Crimson with fury, Oliver started up, overthrew the chair and table, seized Noah by the throat, shook him, in the violence of his rage, till his teeth chattered in his head, and collecting his whole force into one heavy blow, felled him to the ground. A minute ago, the boy had looked the quiet child, mild, dejected creature that harsh treatment had made him, but his spirit was roused at last, the cruel insult to his dead mother had set his blood on fire, his breast heaved, his attitude was erect, his eye bright and vivid, his whole person changed, as he stood glaring over the cowardly tormentor who now lay crouching at his feet, and defied him with an energy he had never known before. He'll murder me, blubbered Noah, Charlotte, Mrs., here's the new boy a murdering of me, help, help, Oliver's gone mad, Char, Lot, Noah's shouts were responded to, by a loud scream from Charlotte, and a louder from Mrs. Sowerberry, the former of whom rushed into the kitchen by a side door, while the latter paused on the staircase till she was quite certain that it was consistent with the preservation of human life, to come further down. Oh, you little wretch, screamed Charlotte, seizing Oliver with her utmost force, which was about equal to that of a moderately strong man in particularly good training. Oh, you little ungrateful, murder ruse, horrid villain. And between every syllable, Charlotte gave Oliver a blow with all her might, accompanying it with a scream, for the benefit of society. Charlotte's fist was by no means a light one, but, lest it should not be effectual in calming Oliver's wrath, Mrs. Sowerberry plunged into the kitchen, and assisted to hold him with one hand, while she scratched his face with the other. In this favorable position of affairs, Noah rose from the ground, and pommeled him behind. This was rather too violent exercise to last long. When they were all wearied out, and could tear and beat no longer, they dragged Oliver, struggling and shouting, but nothing daunted, into the dust cellar, and there locked him up. This being done, Mrs. Sorberry sunk into a chair, and burst into tears. Bless her, she's going off, said Charlotte. A glass of water, Noah, dear, make haste. Oh, Charlotte, said Mrs. Sorberry, speaking as well as she could, through a deficiency of breath, and a sufficiency of cold water, which Noah had poured over her head and shoulders. Oh, Charlotte, what a mercy we have not all been murdered in our beds. Oh, uh, mercy indeed, ma'am, was the reply. I only hope this'll teach Master not to have any more of these dreadful creatures, that are born to be murderers and robbers from their very cradle. Poor Noah, he was all but killed, ma'am, when I come in. Poor fellow, said Mrs. Sowerberry, looking piteously on the charity boy. Noah, whose top waistcoat button might have been somewhere on a level with the crown of Oliver's head, rubbed his eyes with the inside of his wrist, while this commiseration was bestowed upon him, and performed some affecting tears and sniffs. What's to be done? exclaimed Mrs. Sorberry. Your master's not at home. There's not a man in the house, and he'll kick that door down in ten minutes. Oliver's vigorous plunges against the bit of timber in question rendered this occurrence highly probable. Dear, dear, I don't know, ma'am, said Charlotte, unless we send for the police officers. Or the millingtary, suggested Mr. Claypole. No, no, said Mrs. Sorberry, bethinking herself of Oliver's old friend. Run to Mr. Bumble, Noah, and tell him to come here directly, and not to lose a minute. Never mind your cat. Make haste. You can hold a knife to that black eye as you run along. It'll keep the swelling down. Noah stopped to make no reply, but started off at his fullest speed, and very much it astonished the people who were out walking to see a charity boy tearing through the streets pell-mell with no cap on his head and a clasp knife at his eye. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for next chapter. Stay in tune for next chapter.